While we're unable to be together in person today, it's a delight to be able to welcome those from Montreal and from much farther away who might not have had the chance to join us at McGill under normal circumstances. A special welcome to those involved in our Play On 2020 series of events, focusing on ways games with learning outcomes can be leveraged by university instructors to enhance student engagement and develop intrinsic rewards for learning progression. In the last months, we pivoted all our events to focus specifically on how serious play can be a remarkably effective teaching strategy for an online learning environment. Now, it may surprise you that events focusing on digital learning environments are sponsored by the Rare and Special Collections units, the ROAR configuration of units for which I am responsible in the library. But as we hope you'll agree, when you join us for this and for our other Play On series of events, it may be a surprising pairing, but it's also a remarkably fruitful and exciting one that reminds us primary sources can make for moments of wonder in virtual as well as in physical form. Now, to introduce our speaker. We met Michelle last summer as we identified thought leaders and partners for our Play On initiative. We were immediately inspired by Michelle's enthusiasm and commitment to library game curation and the power of games to facilitate, facilitate positive library and learning interactions. Michelle Goodridge has spent over eight years honing her skills as librarian working in academic libraries, developing best practices and thinking innovatively about games and play and education. Some highlights of her game based work include creating and running a game library, developing the Conversational Gamers Second Language Learning Program, partnering with faculty to create an analog game simulation for the classroom, hosting the Game Talk lecture series, and most recently, and I'm almost out of breath with so much activity here, collaborating on the creation of a game archive. In her spare time, Michelle herself is an avid gamer, and she's also a dedicated, an imaginative cosplayer, and she'll tell you more about this, I suspect. Michelle, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you everyone for attending on this wonderful uh, August afternoon as we prepare for the most busiest semester. Um, so I really appreciate you making the time to come out um, to chat. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and we can get started here. Now you should be able to see it. If I see no hands that say no, we will continue. Okay. So yes, my name is Michelle Goodridge um, and I'm here to talk to you a bit about how uh, we can level up or maximize our academic gaming collections and services. So before I get started, Let's look at the agenda. It's going to be action packed. And I want to apologize if some things are skimmed over or things are introduced as ideas. The point of this talk was to kind of, um, you know, get the conversation started, get some discussion going, and to provide you with some takeaways and some ideas that you might want to use at your institution. Um, I also wanted to provide an awful lot of tangible examples. I am a very much a visual um, person, so I like to see how something is applied in practice. Um, so I'm trying to do that as much as I can for you today. Um, but what I wanted to do briefly was go over um, just in general games and academic libraries, where we're at, what the literature is saying, and how we can move forward. I wanna also talk a bit about creating multi-purpose collections. And this is, you know, collections that support a whole host of different initiatives, uh, patron-based groups, and we will talk about that. Uh, how to provide readers advisory for gaming. Um, that's something that's near and dear to my heart, as you'll see soon. Um, creating academic and non-academic programming. Where do you start? What sort of things can you do? Um, how can we faculty, partner with our faculty members on research projects in relation to gaming. Um, another thing that's important is advocating for inclusivity. Uh, we're also gonna talk about creating gaming networks that extend beyond the institution and providing access to new technologies. So, a little about me. 
Uh, as Natalie said, I do cosplay, um, but I wanted to just kind of give some backup uh, information as to who I am, what I do, why I do it, and uh, why I think that I can at least get the conversation going today. So a uh, similar story probably to a lot of folks here who are gamers. I got my first gaming console when I was four. It was the original Nintendo and I got it as a Christmas present. I can remember unboxing that thing and playing with my dad till the wee hours in the morning. Um, we were very avid duck hunt players. Um, and actually anecdotally, my mom has said that I had a better shot than my grandfather who was an OPP staff sergeant. So thank you games. Um, I was also a beta tester for Elder Scrolls Online. Um, I do cosplay, like I said, usually Star Wars characters are, are my go-to. Um, I also play a lot of Magic the Gathering, which you can see my homage in my card that I created here. This is actually an initiative that um, I was trying to put together to be able to hand out to students, to kind of give them something fun, to remember that there's a librarian who's able to help them. So I don't know if you can read it or if it's too blurry, um, but I kind of had fun with the wording there a little bit. Um, and basically overall, I, I love games. I've always loved games. And this job has only made my love of games grow. So I've been uh, the liaison librarian for the game design and development program since January, 2016. Um, I you know, have had lots of opportunities to explore and try new things and connect with people across the country and also in the States. I did a lot of tours of gaming spaces to see what people were up to. Um, I'm happy to chat with anybody that's interested in games and academic libraries because not only is it interesting, I think that the more we talk together, the more we can, you know, bounce off each other ideas and come up with some really solid ways to use our collections. Um, tiny little plug here. I am the co-author of an upcoming book. Um, it's called The Librarian's Guide to Games and Gamers from Collection Development to Advisory Services. My co-author is Matthew Roweeder who is also a librarian at Laurier, and our book will be coming out in March 2021. So quite a bit of what I'm talking about today is in the book in greater detail, um, but I wanted to kind of flag that if this kind of, you know, narrative floats your boat, you can have a check out of our book when it comes out. All right, enough about me, let's talk about games. So I wanted to talk um, a little bit about the state of the literature in regards to gaming in academic spaces. So I think that although this particular quote or summary is eight years old at this point, it does nicely encapsulate most of the literature currently uh, discussing academic gaming collections. So most of the time, authors are talking about the role of video games in research and curriculum at a university level. They're talking about support services uh, to facilitate uh, video game research. So again, very research intensive curriculum based. Um, they're looking at selection policies to build collections to serve your campus needs. Uh, some challenges that face us in the acquisition, preservation and access to video game collections and the role of a collections librarian in shaping the character of a video game study uh, program in an academic setting. So if you've noticed, I said video game a lot. Um, a lot of the literature is very video game intensive when it comes to academic collections, which is fine. There's definitely lessons learned in other um, bits of gaming that we can take away. Um, but I just wanted to flag that as well as I think that we really need to start thinking beyond um, collection development and supporting curriculum because there is so much more that we could be doing and so many more areas that we could kind of explore within this particular discipline. Um, and I also think that um, the old saying of if you build it, they will come is not necessarily true. And as librarians, we really should start thinking about ways to engage our patrons with the collection as opposed to just supplying it to them, hoping that they're going to use it. None of this should really sound shocking, um, but I just kind of wanted to flag it. There have been some standalone studies that kind of delve into this nature, but I think that this is the area that uh, gaming and academic libraries will grow. So 
So as I said, the literature focuses pretty heavily on video games, but what about board games? What about role play? What about collectible card games? Mini figs. There are so many different types of gaming and gamers that only talking about video games is doing them all a bit of a disservice. Um, there have been some studies on, say, the preservation of a circulating board game collection, I believe, by the University of North Texas. There has also been some literature uh, coming out on collection development for, for these sorts of collections. But again, it's pretty few and far between, really. Um, and for most literature that you're going to find that's talking about board games or other gaming uh, collections, you're going to be looking at public libraries. And I think that the folks in public libraries are really doing some great work exploring how we can use um, and provide different sorts of gaming collections to our patrons. So I think that there's a lot of information we can pull from what's happening in the public library sector. Um, and I think that in general, they're, they're getting a little more focused on practical application and development uh, and management of collections uh, rather, you know, than them more of like the academic sort of side of things where we focus heavily on research intensive projects or supporting curriculum. And I think both are important. And I think um, we can look to a gaming collection, not only from this, you know, very academic curriculum based context, but also in other ways that it can support our patrons and our community. So, Beyond collection development, these are some of the things that I think we can start to think about uh, when we're wanting to try to level up our gaming collections. So things such as supplying role game, role play game supplies. So when I say supplies, for those who haven't played a vigorous Dungeons and Dragons campaign, um, you would be looking at grid paper. You would be looking at miniature figurines that kind of. Um, are people's avatars in the game, or they count as monsters that you encounter. Um, they're also going to need different rule books. Um, they're going to need a screen if they're the dungeon master. So there's all these additional sort of materials that usually an academic library wouldn't consider circulating or having. So if we can kind of supply what they need to host a full campaign, this will help in our programming, this will help in our accessibility, um, this will, you know, entice people to use the collection, especially if they've never done it before. Having really engaging programming is also important. I think that, um, again, just building it is not enough. I think we really need to have supports and services and interest in actually using the collection. Um, and that includes making really engaging, exciting, fun programming. And that can be around a whole bunch of things and we're going to talk about programming later. Um, having extra peripherals, so buying a PlayStation 4 that comes with one controller, not enough, especially if someone's going to play with other people. You're going to want to have extra PlayStation controllers. You're going to want to, you know, explore, um, you know, different game based peripherals, uh, depending on what it is. So. Do you want to have extra component pieces? Do you want to get expansions for some of your board games? Um, other things that kind of enhance the, the experience with that collection. One thing that's really interesting that I've been working on is this idea of intuitive discoverability. So without getting into it in too much detail, you can have all your games on open shelves, you can have them in closed shelves, um, and you can have them in your library catalog. There's been studies done that actually not a lot of people catalog fully their gaming collections. And even if they do, when somebody encounters them online, they're not necessarily either aware that the gaming collection even exists or they're, you know, unsure how to browse it, how to search it. Does it mimic, you know, um, what it looks like when you go to a game cafe? So when you're at a game cafe, usually everything is grouped together by like item, it's usually alphabetized, but if we look to Library of Congress, that's not how the games actually appear when they're cataloged. So, for example, uh, our board game collection, I think, has six different LC numbers. So, you know, it'll be alphabetized for one section and then it'll go to the next. And when we have, you know, student staff who are shelving or even when we have people browsing the collection, 
that's not really intuitive, especially if they're looking for something that they actually know. And it's the same with our digital games. We physically locate them based on system and alphabet. And that's more or less what they're used to when they go to a game store. So they're like, oh, what Mario games do you have? And you can quickly find those as opposed to necessarily relying on the LC numbers that don't put everything necessarily in order. So there's a lot of work I think that can be done about making the collections more discoverable. Having knowledgeable staff is also very important. You're going to encounter some interesting questions when people come in to talk to you about games. They're going to um, be asking uh, about playing mechanics. They're gonna be asking you know, how challenging a game is or, oh, I like this game, what about this game? And we're gonna talk about ways you can prepare staff for those questions. But I think that that's something more akin to our public library folks who do a lot of reader's advisory services, um, being able to actually point and direct patrons to something out of interest as opposed to something tied to what it is they're researching is new for us, I think. Um, being able to market our collections to make them again discoverable um, and that people wanna come and use them and know about them. If I had a nickel for every time someone said, oh my gosh, I didn't realize you had as many games as you have, or I didn't know you had a collection, or I didn't know I could request things and have them sent to another campus. It's all these things that we need to, to do a better job on to get people using the collection. Having our champions, people who support the collection being there and want to use it in unique and different ways, especially faculty members. Are there ways that they could use it in their curriculum? Are there ways they could use it for outside programming, community outreach? So again, finding our champions and running with it and creating community partnerships. We'll talk a little bit about what these community partnerships might look like, but I think that the gaming community is an interesting community because a lot of times they're willing and able and excited to help, and we can really tap into that and use it to our advantage. Uh, this picture I would like to point out is one of my staff members, Yelena, showing off one, our new shipment of games that we got in 2019. Very happy that she's there. I was like, oh, pose and look like you're having fun. And this is what I get. So um, she definitely uh, was one of my one of my favorites to work with. So I was talking about having knowledgeable staff, and this is where I'm going to introduce a concept that my co-author and I have uh, called gamers advisory. So rather than readers advisory, although similar, we've kind of named it its own thing and we've broken it down in different pieces that are important to be able to help your patrons. So uh, you need to be able to understand the player's motivation, the player's intent, their preferences, their ability, and their comfort level. And these are all things that will help them in selecting something that they want to play. So we'll talk about motivation on the next slide, but I'll go through the other four. So intent would be, do they plan to play alone? Are they gonna play in a group? Are they hosting a party? Are they looking for a challenge? One second, I have a thing in the chat. My screen is dark. Slides are working well. Oh, um, well, oh, sorry. I don't know. I've got all the lights on and the windows are open. I'm not really sure what else I can do. Um, sorry about that. Michelle, perhaps try resharing, um, turning your video off and turning it on again. Let's see if that refreshes it. Sure. Sorry, everyone. Okay, off, on, is that better? It looks the same to me, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure quite what's happening, but the slides are, are great, so keep going. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry if you can't see me in my lovely purple hair. I will, I will try to fix it, um, right. So we're talking about intent. Um, so are they hosting a party? Are they looking for a, you know, a personal challenge? What is the intent behind, behind finding this particular game? Um, their preferences. So 
This, this is really important because a lot of players will have, you know, a particular console that they really like to play, you know, they only play Xbox, they only play PlayStation, they only play Nintendo. So learning those things are important or mechanics that they really like. Maybe they really like, you know, puzzle games or they like adventure games or open world games. Um, maybe they want, you know, a card based game. Maybe they want something where they get to paint stuff and have more of an artistic uh, contribution to the game. So again, figuring out what their preferences are. Uh, an ability. So how skilled are they in a particular, you know, gaming genre? Are they, you know, looking for something that is a little bit easier, a little bit harder, something again that will challenge them? Um, and also this ability comes into play with accessibility, which we talk about later. But, you know, do they need a game that has it? enhanced accessibility functions in it. So can they change the colors for colorblind or can they use an adaptive controller? So again, these are things that we need to know. And then their overall comfort level. Do they want to try something new or do they want to go old hat? Do they want something that's similar to what they've played before or do they want something completely different? They saw someone on the internet, they want to try that. So understanding what their comfort level is for switching over and trying new things versus kind of staying with what they know. I hope you can see me. <laughs> so player motivation, um, there are so many different frameworks for player motivation. I've highlighted a very, very, very simple one, which has pros and cons because it's so simple, it's hard to necessarily throw everybody into, you know, one of four boxes. Um, but it is at least good to illustrate the fact that lots of research has gone into understanding video game players um, motivation, which I think can be applied to other types of games. Um, so, as you see here, it's a chart with killers, achievers, explorers and socialites. So, you know, killers, they want to they want to win. They want to be able to rank. They want to be directly competing against somebody else. They really like leaderboards. You know, they like this idea that they are number one or they can be the best at something. Whereas achievers, while still wanting to be the best and attaining status, they also really like having a lot of goals, a lot of things that they can check off that they've done, or they want to be able to complete something completely. So I don't know if you're familiar with when you play a video game, you can do a speed run and get through it really fast, or you can go through and complete every single mini quest and mission. Um, these are the folks that like to do that sort of thing. Then there's explorers, again, who like open world. They like to kind of figure stuff out, not necessarily follow a linear path, see kind of what options are available to them. Um, they like to discover new things. And then socialites like to play with friends. They like the social aspect of gaming. So this is Richard Bartle's work. Um, but as I said, there are many other frameworks and <clears throat> I get into it at length in the book, but basically I wanted to make you aware that they exist. They can be very helpful and they're also very helpful for just kind of understanding who our users are and what kind of motivates them to play the games that they play. Okay. We've gotten to programming. So. In this little section, I wanted to give some examples of programs that I've done. I can chat more about particular ones or ones that I might have missed. But the idea is we want to not only make curriculum based, but we want to go beyond. So I think important things to know are thinking about potential partnerships. These partnerships could be um, students who want to showcase games that they've made, or maybe they're looking for play testers. So people who can come and test out their game to see if it makes sense, see if there's anything they need to change. This is a very popular thing in game design where you make a game and you test it out and have people play it and give you feedback. Or maybe it's a community member or community uh, board game creator or video game creator who wants to come in and have people test their game and give feedback. And then they can talk about their process and how it is that they create a game. So then we kind of have positives on both sides. Um, maybe it's a local gaming establishment that might be able to donate prizes for an event or materials for a program. So I ran a paint night once for Warhammer minifigurines 
and the local uh, game store donated all of the figures and all of the paints, um, which was fantastic. So then we were able to run that program um, for people who were just interesting, interested in learning about painting, because that's that's a whole subgenre of Instagram holes that you can go into watching people paint elaborate miniature figurines to play uh, minifig tabletop games. Um, you could also partner with other academic units or courses to run an event. So I've run uh, a joint event between the criminology department and the game design department because we brought a guest speaker who actually filled both um, you know, interests. Or maybe you know, we're looking to create a game to illustrate research that's going on in an area and we can involve students and we can make you know, a scavenger hunt out of it or collect community feedback. Like there's lots of opportunities to you know, reach out and create partnerships and bring people in. I also think about your technological abilities um, and capabilities. So what can you can can you do and what can you not do? Um, are you able to hook up you know a system to a big screen? Um, do you have to go low tech and do board games? Um, so what what are you able to offer um, to your patrons that might be of interest? Um, one thing that's pretty popular is coding or teaching people how to create games, say, in Unity, which is a software that a lot of game designers use. So do you know someone who could teach them that? Do you know how to use it? That sort of thing. Um, and be creative and always try new things. Um, I would say three quarters of my programs go well and then a quarter, eh. So you kind of have to keep trying and figuring out what it is that will appeal to people. And this changes regionally, this changes you know, based on whatever makeup your particular institution has. So some things might be popular or work well for some and not for others. So, I mean, I'm, I'm all for trying different things to try to figure out what works best. And I'm, I'm okay with a little bit of failure if it gets me to the right place. Um, and also consider some skill development opportunities, not only for your um, participants, but for staff too. You can teach you know, your staff members a new software or a new program, or you can use it for skill building. Like there's so many options. And I just wanna make sure that we're also remembering, it's totally okay also to have fun just for the sake of having fun. You know, students are stressed out at exams, maybe we need a game night, you know, um, maybe the, the staff need, you know, a retreat day so we can all play games, get to know each other better. I think that there's always, this you know necessity in the back of our minds that a game has a goal or that you know there's some sort of learning outcome or something is happening and it doesn't have to be that way and i think that's the fun in gaming collections is there are so many different sort of boxes and and ways we can go and things we can check and things we can accomplish and i just don't want to lose the sight of having fun for the sake of having fun so on this screen you'll see a few other programs that I've done, um, the game night for conversational uh, language learning was mentioned. So this was a partnership between the YMCA, Laurier, Laurier International, also Conestoga College got involved. So we had uh, domestic students having um, conversations with international students to improve their English language skills. They also made friends and were able to have game be like that bridge that brought everybody together. Um, in the middle, we have a program at the top called Fail Game Day, where I talk about what makes a game not work and how can we try to fix it. And I ran this at a public library for children. Um, it was very fun, it's interesting. I had someone turn Monopoly into a D&D &D campaign, so that was cool. Um, so you never know what you're gonna get, and you just kind of try it out. Um, the bottom is some of the programs that we've had long standing at the public library. I do a lot of partnership programs with them because they're right beside my campus. Um, so we have an introduction to D&D. &D. Um, we had a program called Get Your Game On where every single month I would bring a new game in different genres and formats and introduce people to it. So if you can see there, we were doing Star Wars trivia, Warhammer and Overwatch were the three that we did for that semester. Um, and we've also done creating 3D avatars online, all kinds of interesting things. And I'll talk more about online programs in a sec. 
Um, and then the purple one was something done by the Brant County Museum or Brant County Library, where they had um, for International Video Game Day, a panel of game designers come in and give a talk to the community. So there's really no limit to what sorts of things you can do and for homework. I suggest you think about International Games Week. So it happens every year. Uh, it's sponsored through um, the uh, game gaming roundtable through ALA, and they have templates that help you create posters, and you can come up with some interesting things that you can do in your library for that week. And it's like a branded known thing, and we try to do stuff every single year. Um, this year will be a little different, but I can give you some suggestions based on what we're looking at. So programming online versus in person, obviously there are some challenges, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. Um, so some examples of things that I've been doing, um, we have D&D campaigns that run online. Um, there's one that we're working on with a uh, student uh, like Residence Life, and they're running it for off -count campus housing. Um, people who would normally have been in residence. Um, so that's something that you can run if you've got people that are comfortable doing that. I don't know if you're familiar with what Jackbox is, but it's a um, basically a digital board game kind of thing that you can buy through Steam, for example, and you can run it, I believe, on Xbox and PlayStation as well. Um, but you buy these little kits, and you can run a game and the different games include like drawing games or puzzle games or trivia games and people log in um, because they're given a code and then they're able to play and compete against each other so we've done a few jackbox game nights and that's something we're thinking of doing for international games week this year uh, you can host mario kart tournaments so if you have a switch um, you can friend people that want to join in and then invite them to an online room and play that way. You can also do a more localized tournament if you're using a Wii U. Um, you can do 3D design workshops. So you'll see here an ad for one that I worked on with the Milton Public Library. Um, so designing a character to use in their D&D campaigns and how do you do that? We used all free software. Um, so I just gave a demonstration on how it is you can do that. There's lots of online board game uh, providers too, like Tabletop Simulator. So you can play uh, tabletop games that people are familiar with online. You can obviously have guest lectures. Um, so again, this is part of your building a community. Once you've built a community, you can tap on them and get them to come in and give guest lectures. Or there's also this idea of using massive multiplayer online games for educational purposes. I will not go into great detail on this only because someone else did it. They wrote a paper on it. Highly recommend reading it. Um, but basically what they did was they had a campaign and the facilitators kind of worked with um, English language learners on their team. So there was an incentive to improve their skills and to practice their skills so that they would be successful in the game. Um, so this is something else that you could definitely look into running or having a team or something that goes through the library. So I just wanted to highlight that as a potential thing. I also realized that I'm getting close to time. So let's see here. Partnering with faculty is also very important. Um, collaborating obviously on research projects is ideal if you can, or being able to co-teach or develop some sort of game-based teaching, um, you know, methodology or game. Um, being able to assist with connecting a game to resources in their curriculum. So I've had, for example, history professors ask me, do we have board games that cover, you know, X, Y, or Z topic? It's like, yes, we do. You could use them. Or our um, science librarian really likes using games like um, evolution in the classroom to be able to talk about evolution and have the, the students kind of team up and, and play against each other. Um, you can also foster collab collaboration across disciplines and connect your faculty with the community using games. So on the slide, you'll see there's a uh, event notice for a small conference. I would even call it more of like a, like a one-off talk, we'll say. <laughs> it was pretty small, but it, it was an interesting idea. 
So what it was, was to have faculty members come talk to the public um, about what it is that they research and kind of connecting it to a game. So some of my examples were like using, the it's 2017, I'm a fortune teller, uh, using pandemic to <laughs> illustrate the impact of public health policies, right? So there's a game called Pandemic. Maybe that's something that we can tie into. So we're disseminating research into the community. We're talking about, you know, games and making it more easily digestible for the community and also having a little bit of fun along the way. So this was a, a really interesting event to run and look after. Also, um, I did some work with a human rights professor on creating a foreign policy uh, in-game simulation so we could teach students about why countries make decisions that go against human rights and why on earth would they ever do that? So we're trying to you know, show them they have competing interests, they have things that they're trying to you know, get reelected, they have you know, extenuating circumstances that make them uh, maybe make some choices that maybe we wouldn't personally make and being able to under try to understand that a little bit better. Um, so we developed a game, we did a bunch of research on it, published a paper, and Andrew to this day says he would have never done it had I not walked into his office and said, hey, let's make a game. So, um, you know, sometimes it just takes that little nudge and, and curiosity and people get interested. Um, quickly here, we'll talk about accessibility in games and how that's important for what it is we do. This is a brief history of accessibility in gaming um, with the takeaway that it's not great and it's not um, done yet. Our work is not done. And I think as um, you know, library folk, we can definitely uh, champion the rights of making a more accessible and inclusive environment for gaming. Um, some of the ways that we can do that um, would be providing accessible controllers. So interestingly enough, um, I mean, Nintendo tried to do it in the 80s, didn't really take off. But uh, when Xbox released their accessible controller, that was kind of an uh, interesting point because it was the first mass market uh, accessible controller made, um, you know, in the in the 2000s. And while it's been successful, it hasn't completely been a tipping point. So other, you know, people are being really creative and they're making, you know, 3D printed Joy-Cons for a Nintendo Switch to make it more accessible. But for the most part, it's all, you know, research and interest and, you know, kind of grassroots as to making games more accessible. And there's lots of organizations out there that do this. This is a pet project of mine. I'm happy to talk more about it, but just know that this is an area that we can definitely uh, explore. And then accessible design as well. So the screenshot on the bottom here is a game called Destiny and it um, allowed for um, some, accessible features for deaf players. So changing sounds as a cue in a game to a vibration or text so that they don't lose um, any sort of gameplay that they, you know, it doesn't affect their gameplay experience. And more and more AAA companies are trying to do this and they include things like colorblind modes, larger subtitles, you can remap buttons to, you know, based on how did you hold a controller or are able to but it's very inconsistent and it's definitely something that we can continue to work on as well as inclusivity, as I said. So creating codes of conduct for our events and spaces, being more inviting to our, our patrons, you know, um, encouraging inclusive participation with different sort of, um, you know, events like cosplay contests or um, having loanable equipment also to make our, our collection more accessible for those who cannot afford to play. So it's one thing to have, you know, a whole catalog of PlayStation 4 games. What if our patrons can't afford to buy a PlayStation 4? By providing equipment as well as software, I think that we can kind of work towards at least making it more accessible from that point of view as well. So I think this is a huge field that I just kind of barely tapped into here that we can explore. Um, making our community networks is super important. Um, 
I run a game talk series every year where I go out into the community and make friends with people and try to get them to come talk. So they could be developers, co-founders, uh, authors. I've had board game creators, uh, digital game creators, but creating this sort of network not only gives you people to put on your guest list, but it also um, could re relate into possible donations. Um, maybe there's possible student employment opportunities out of this. Maybe they'll help you with programming. Maybe they'll help you advertise your programming if you're going out into the community. And maybe there's development potential. So I think that this is something also that we can work on to partner more with our communities. New tech trends. Obviously, uh, libraries can provide access to expensive new technology to enhance studies and to enhance um, the experience of our students. So we can encourage them to explore new tech um, and see how it could be applied in their career path. I know the lovely folks at Carleton do a lot of work with the architecture students on using VR to draw um, designs. And I think that that's really cool and it could be somewhere where that field is moving in the future. So why not get ahead of that? Um, and also the new tech is an excellent draw to your event. So every time I pull out the Oculus Rift at an event, people are there, they wanna play. So it's also a really good marketing tool for your collection. What other areas can we explore? Well, really, <laughs> I just barely scratched the surface, I feel. Um, I think it's a growing field with endless possibilities. And I think that we really need to continue to look at our public library friends for inspiration and connect with other gaming and libraries folks. I've listed um, a couple spots here. So there's the ALA Games and Gaming Roundtable and uh, something that I'd started, the Gaming and Libraries Listserv, just to get people talking, spread more ideas. I think that, you know, again, this, this study and this application in academic libraries is still pretty new. And I think the more that we can bring people together of common interest, the better. So with that, I think I'm just at time and we can start the Q&A. Thank you. Michelle, that was absolutely terrific. Um, I wonder if you could stop sharing your screen because you, yep. we lost the visuals of you when you started sharing your screen. So maybe oh, that will change. Okay. Let me, uh, let me not. One sec. Uh, stop sharing. Sorry. I don't use this. There we are. Question. Hello. That, that works. <laughs> Hello. No, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions? See something about online board games and free applications. So I had mentioned it briefly, but there are a few things that you can do to do board games online. Um, so, and different, different ones will have different requirements um, depending on how it is they're, they're structured. So I would suggest having a peek. I have a list um, that my colleague shared with me where she made an Excel sheet of all the different ones that are available and how it is that you can access them and, and kind of rated them, which is fabulous. Um, but in the meantime, I'm just seeing here, going back. My apologies. I want to make sure I get their names right. Um, there's Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator are two of the more common ones. Um, I can probably type that out if that is helpful. That's great. We also circulate um, a video of the event after the fact, and we also provide links or information about any resources that are mentioned and people you know, attendees really like that. So we do the follow up. Yeah, no worries. Okay, uh, another question. Um, let me see. Should I read these out? I can read these out. I usually do a modified old board game session in my class to create a literacy game, but how would I do it virtually? So to follow up with that, are you taking an existing old game and kind of everybody mods the game to make it something different for the literacy game? 
if I'm understanding correctly. Yes, yes, okay. Um, so I've done something kind of similar. Um, depending on the size of the class and kind of what's happening, um, you could try to use some online tools for brainstorming. So you could have the physical copy of the game, let's say, and you could have it on a video and maybe make, say, a Padlet and have people kind of put down their ideas. They can include visuals. They can kind of brainstorm off of each other on different things that they could change and then maybe you would change it in front of them for them or um, kind of working together in that sense. You also could maybe suggest, depending on the game, um, if they're able to get a copy, uh, like say it's Monopoly or something, um, probably go to a thrift store and find an old copy of it and then they can participate along with you or make their own. And then you could have people in teams that kind of display what it is that they've created. Um, it is kind of a challenge right now when we have something so physical and we're trying to do it virtually. Um, but I think that there's some maybe creative ways that we could try to work around it, or you could do like a breakout group um, to try to, uh, to have different people work on different bits, um, if that makes it easier. I hope that helped. I'm, I'll be really curious to see how that goes. Uh, oh, we have another question. What is the future of women in the gaming industry? The latest Ubisoft scandal has reminded us that the fight for equality is far from over. What are your thoughts on the current state of the industry? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I, have, I have some interesting thoughts. Um, I just in general, I'm pretty upset with uh, AAA developers who insist on things like crunch time um, and don't pay their workers fairly and equitably throughout the year. Um, I think that, that that's not fair. And we've had a lot of real conversations where we've had people in the um, digital game world come and talk to our students because these are things that maybe they're not aware of. Um, as I said, crunch is ridiculous. So I, for those that aren't aware, you know, you'll have a hard deadline where you have to finish a game and uh, workers will be required to work ridiculous hours, like 16 hour days to be able to try and get it done on time. Um, and they're not necessarily compensated in a way that I would view as fair for working that hard for that short amount of time. Um, so just in general, that's, that's not a good thing. Um, I'm not aware of the exact Ubisoft scandal that you're perhaps referring to in Montreal. Um, sexual harassment. Okay. Yes. So um, I think that this is part of creating more inclusive environments, I think, starting from the get go. Um, I think that sometimes, um, like this, this happens in, in all sorts of different fields as well, right? So we see a lot of it. In Hollywood, and we see a lot of it um, in different tech sectors where you know people who have power um, perhaps do bad things with that power, or um, you know people feel that they can't report things and they can't talk to somebody honestly about something that's happening. And I think that that's awful. And I think that we can start having those conversations with our students and with the future. Um, people who will be going into this sector and industry to try to, to help um, change what that is like. And I think lots of people are trying to change it. And I'm glad that more and more of this is coming out and it's, you know, being um, being more, more discussed. I think for a long time, people didn't really talk about these things and that's not how we have change. So, I don't work in that that industry personally, but I would I'm very supportive of anyone that does. And um, I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but um, I think that that having speakers also come and talk has been really great too. Um, it's really opened my eyes to a lot of the different things that I didn't know about either, in ways that we can try to to talk about it. Um, what are the most popular games in the collection? Good question. Um, your general uh, Switch games, so Smash Bros, 
always out. <laughs> People love that. Um, a lot, actually our Switch games circulate quite heavily. Um, they're probably the more popular of like the video game section, uh, stuff like, um, you know, your, your standards like Call of Duty or um, Assassin's Creed come out a lot for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. Um, for board games, um, it's kind of hit or miss. It depends on the semester. Um, there's a lot of general ones that go out a lot because people are familiar with the names. So Cards Against Humanity, super popular, Catan, Carcassonne. Um, uh, but then if, if the students are doing a project on something in particular, then that one goes out a lot. So I would say it's kind of it's kind of hit or miss. And our stats we're just starting to go up and then COVID happens. So we're not circulating the collection anymore. Um, and I wanted to really campaign hard and market it better. So when that happens, reach out and I will tell you, I'm happy to share those statistics with you. I um, also wanna ask you for you. Okay, sorry. There's two, <laughs> thanks for your suggestions. Also want to ask about Unity for Research Project, email you. Yes, email me and we can chat, whoever that is. Um, how do you find games help language learning in a way that differs from traditional styles? How is the gaming slang approach? Oh, okay, so, um, oh, this is gonna make me sound pompous. Um, I wrote a, a book chapter about this, um, but I can quickly go over it. Um, one of the things that was found to be uh, good uh, for using games instead was um, it does it gives a more friendly sort of atmosphere for students. Um, they're not they don't feel as singled out as they do in the classroom when they have to put up their hand and, and discuss something. It's also an opportunity to bring together domestic and international students. Whereas sometimes you'll have problems in a mono um, language international classroom, um, being able to pull them together. Um, to be able to play the game kind of encourages them to develop the skills a little bit quicker and to practice. Um, trying to think of all the things off the top of my head. There were some problems, I will say, with some games who had a lot of slang or a lot of um, uh, like colloquial phrases or th things that we would know that, that others wouldn't or pop culture references, for example. So um, we play the game Funglish a lot and the game Word Slam a lot to help with um, building vocabulary. And they both had um, like uh, pop culture references in them. So we just took all those cards out because we kept struggling. Um, you know, either we would sit there and we would explain and that's fine, but then we would kind of break the momentum of the game. Um, so we would wait until uh, the participants had mastered the language a little bit better to reintroduce those phrases. A lot of times they would have their cell phones out with their translators anyway um, to try to understand what some of that is, but the translators don't always have all of the slang and all of the pop culture references. So, what are some uh, surprises I've encountered when rolling out a game collection and making it accessible? Um, Surprises, um, making a library announcement, sending out a Twitter post, a Facebook post, and an email was not enough in some cases to tell people we had a collection. Um, we had to, we have to change how it is we market it to make it even more apparent because we're still having people accidentally discover us. Um, I know that when we got the accessible controller for the Xbox, that made a lot of people really excited. And we kind of um, are looking at ways to make that more widely known as well. Um, other surprises, uh, having games go into a drop-in and explode, and you have to pick up the pieces and put them back in. That was not great. Um, and how bored my students get when I ask them to count all of the pieces in all of the games periodically. Um, there's been there's been so many interesting things and so many surprises. Um, I mean, I, I could go on and on um, at length and I'd be happy to talk with whoever this is um, about this in more detail. But um, yeah, there's been so many surprises. I confess that was actually my question. 
So I'm, <laughs> I'm fascinated to hear. <laughs> Michelle, that was absolutely terrific. Thank you so much. You shared tons of information and um, we'll be sure to circulate the video to everybody attending. And also if you have any tips or, or things that you think would be useful for them to know or sites to visit, do let us know and we can share those as well. Yeah, so. I included a bibliography slide at the very end of the uh, presentation, so I can make that available so you guys can all see that. Um, that would be and terrific. And maybe also maybe, <laughs> and maybe that table of the, of the different player profiles. That's That was yeah. a useful slide too. So I have some thank yous and then I also have um, a very big announcement at the end of my comments. So huge thanks to you, Michelle. Three other quick thank yous. Thanks to the webinar team who you're not seeing visibly on the screens at the moment, but to Hannah Deskin, Michelle McLeod, Julien Couture, and Thomas Dodlin, without whom these webinars just couldn't happen. Um, to the Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada, as well as to private sponsors, Ron Harvey and Doug Bagley, for making this series possible. Um, and to you for coming. And we, we look forward to having you at our next event which is actually on September the 17th at 5 p.m. And it's going to be puppetry as a tool for transformation with puppeteer Jesse Strong. So that's going to be great fun. Um, and here's the announcement. On Thursday, we are launching the first ever McGill digital alternative reality game. Um, and it will launch at 9 a.m. on the 27th. We will send out information about it with our follow-up email. But for those of you who like to play games, please give it a try. Um, please send us the feedback because we are um, launching it for the very first time. Our test people are having super fun. And it's an idea to orient new students who may not be in Montreal to the campus and to McGill at a time during COVID when it's not possible necessarily to actually give them tours around campus. So we'll tell you more about that. In the meantime, stay safe, enjoy playing, and thanks so much, Michelle. Bye, everyone.